The big question, is influencer marketing ruining sewing? That's going to be the question we will be delving in tonight. Welcome to Sewing Report Live. I'm your host, Jen. Welcome. This is your first time here. Every Sunday at 6 p.m. Eastern Time, we go over what is going on in the world of sewing. We have fun. We chat. We go over uh, various stories. So welcome if this is your first time here. And I want to give a quick shout out as usual to tonight's sponsor, which is the Sewing Report Etsy shop where you can find fabric and sewing supplies and a few handmade items. I just placed an inventory order because we are sold out of a few items. You guys have been keeping me busy with the shop. You can go there at sewingreport.etsy.com and shopping here helps support the channel and helps support this uh, independent media. So I know a lot of you guys have already uh, been customers and I appreciate every single one of you. I pack and ship these orders personally myself. And uh, yeah, I was packing a few orders this week. We are having a sale on fabric bundles. So if you haven't been there yet, check it out. I just got in these new woven labels, which are super cute. And I'm actually excited to try them out myself. We have a few different types and they are $8 per pack for eight. We also have this really cool refresh fat quarter bundle. I've got three of those left. It's a fantastic deal. It's 14 fat quarters for $34. And it's a really nice, like kind of a like more subdued floral pattern. So really pretty colors, lots of great stuff. The quilt binding spools are also popular items. Uh, so lots in the shop and again I did just place an inventory order because you guys have been wiping me out on certain certain items yes there are some real popular the sew tights are always super popular so uh, by doing that again uh, this show again this is why I sponsor myself is so we can talk about some of the topics uh, we do here and yeah tonight we got a spicy one we got a spicy one because there was a lot of hubbub the past week or so around um, review review videos and you know brands and marketing and all in content creators so I want to get into that uh, also before we get started a couple quick housekeeping rules just if you are participating in the chat or if you're here with the replay crew I just ask that everyone that chats or leaves a comment you know guys be cool be kind, be nice to each other, be polite, like no bashing each other, no bashing me, and no politics. So this is a politics-free zone. So hope everyone's doing well, guys. Hope everyone's doing well. It is a Sunday night, guys. I have been, yeah, it's been it's been a fun uh, a fun week for sure. And for real, I'm usually not a morning person, and I've really been trying to go to bed at a decent hour and get up at a decent hour and I've sort of been getting in a new routine this week guys I've been getting up at 8 a.m which for me is insane like before that I was getting up at like 1 30 p.m 2 p.m 3 p.m and I just didn't want to live like that so was it last week I decided so I kind of stayed up all night so I took a nap one evening at like 8 p.m I woke up at like midnight then I stayed up for definitely over 20. Oh, so I tried to stay up for like, so I woke up around midnight and then I tried to stay up until like, I was really, you know, I tried to stay up until like 11 p.m. the next night, fell asleep like a rock. And then I woke up at like 7 a.m. So since then I've been sort of getting myself on a new routine. I've been drinking massive amounts of iced coffee with my new espresso maker that I've been making. And uh, it's been a fun time. My rabbit is really confused by the schedule change. She's like, what is going on, girl? She's like, I don't know what, I don't know what you're doing. So that's been my, that's been my new thing for the week. Uh, but it's been interesting. So I've been getting up real early. I've been trying to go to bed. I've been usually able to go to sleep, fall asleep by like maybe 1230, which for me is really good. And I've been setting my alarm for around eight o'clock. So I'm amazed. I I was on a night schedule for years and years and years, and I never thought I would be able to get back to like a normal per person schedule. And I'm I feel like I'm starting. I feel like I'm starting to do it. So 
I'm starting, guys. I am starting. Hello, Ryan. You, I think you're new here. I haven't seen you. I've not seen you here before, but welcome if this is your first time here. And also, if you're here from the main channel, so I have two channels. I have this channel where we mostly talk about, like, what's going on. And then I have uh, the Sewing Report main channel where it's more like straight up sewing and brighter videos. If you do have questions about the videos, you're welcome to ask them here. Um, I wanted to give people like an avenue to reach me in real time, um, you know, because a lot of people often want to ask questions about videos and everything else. So I'm really happy to have everybody here. We got, we definitely have some new people in the chat that I don't recognize before. I think Rachel, I know you've been here before and Ms. Kitty 1925. We got Nancy here from Wilmington. Very awesome. Okay, so you got some opinions. And I've linked some resources down in the description box so you can kind of, I like to give everyone sort of a preview of what we'll be talking about so you can check it out beforehand. All right, Rachel says, sleeping in chunks like that is called biphasic sleep and it works really well for some people. So I felt like I got run over by a truck for the first few days. Like I was like, but now I'm starting to, I feel like I'm starting to get with the program. So, but if you don't know, um, like if you're kind of new to this whole thing, um, I used to be a TV news producer and I had the worst schedule, maybe with the exception of like a doctor, like doctors and nurses have really bad schedules too. Uh, but my schedule was pretty crazy for like 15 years. I never had like a consistent schedule. And I worked overnights a lot. I worked weekends and my schedule was all over the place. So ever since then, I've been pretty messed up and I'm not, I was like not a morning person. So it's been pretty, it's been pretty wild guys. It's been pretty wild. So yeah, that's my week. And this today, like, I don't know what my hair is like, not Yeah, It's not really quite, you, you can tell too. Like I choose like, pictures I've taken of myself in the past for the thumbnails and I think you have probably realized by now that's not what I look like on the actual stream I try to like sometimes I'll try to wear the same shirt but like I can't I so I can never get my hair to look the same two days in a row so every single time I do my hair it just doesn't look this it just doesn't look the same <laughs> so it does not look the same all right, but welcome if you are here, if you're welcome. So we will be going over to the over um, the main topic a little bit later on. I do have another story I want to talk about first uh, because I haven't seen anything like this happen. Hello, Lisa. So Lee, we got some new folks up in here. We got some familiar faces. I know, I think Vanessa, I feel like you've been here before. But thanks for everyone for tuning in. We have a lot of fun. It's Sunday night. But yeah, this is my new schedule. So... I had, I actually had time today to like take a shower and like do some other, I packed some Etsy orders before doing this. And it was surprising because normally like last week, you know, I would get up at like 2 p.m. And then the show would be at like the beginning of the day, but now it's at the end of the day. Like I'm going to go to bed in a few hours. And I, I already ate dinner. So that's been pretty wild. So yeah, it's been a pretty weird week. Um, I did put out a video over on the sewing report. I've been, I don't know, I've been having trouble getting, I don't know, I've just been having trouble, like, with my content production schedule lately, I don't know, but I managed to get out a video um, all about using the fonts and lettering in the Art Spira app on the Brother Sketch, which I have a love-hate relationship with, and we will be talking about that a little bit more later, too, um, but yeah, so, but yeah, we have fun, this is sort of a casual environment. Okay, so the first thing I do want to get to, let me turn off the music here. Okay, so I don't know if you've heard of this company before. I was, I'm not super familiar with, I'm not super familiar with them, but I've heard of it. So there's this company, a small indie pattern, there's a small indie pattern company called Deer and Doe Patterns. And it appears they've been acquired by another indie pattern company, which I think th I think this is the first time I've really heard of this happening. I could be wrong, but I thought this was fairly interesting. So I wanted to share this with you because I saw this on Instagram this week and I was like, oh, that's, you know, pretty interesting news. All right. So they put out this announcement on Instagram. It says, goodbye and thank you. The future of deer and doe. 
and it says, Today we have a major announcement to share with our community. The last 10 years of running deer and doe have been incredibly fulfilling, but life is full of changing seasons, and the time has come for me and Eleanor. It's like It looks like it's like these are the two people behind deer and doe. Uh, the time has come for me and Eleanor to write the next chapter of our lives. Well, this is goodbye for us. It is with much excitement that we are announcing the sale of deer and doe to our very capable friends and experienced pattern designers, Closet Core Patterns. While designing sewing patterns for a living has been a blessing beyond belief, uh, the time has come for a change. After the roller coaster of last year, it became clear to both of us that we could no longer give D&D the creative and emotional energy it deserved. Our hope was to find a buyer with the resources to continue offering bilingual patterns and support. Closet Core was our first choice and the only company we approached. Not only do they have a consistent track record of publishing high quality sewing patterns, but they are, oh, sewing patterns in both English and French, but they are also a Quebec based company with the infrastructure and expertise to take care of our many French customers. We know they are the perfect candidate for the job and trust them to do it well. Their site is now the only place to purchase a deer and doe patterns and they plan to release new designs in 2025. Uh, this week, they are migrating your download history to a new account page on their site. You'll get an email when it's ready. To have all questions answered, uh, please head to the blog for a detailed statement and complete frequently asked questions. All right, yeah, let's, we'll, we'll go ahead and check that out. Please know that this is not a sad announcement. Change always comes with exciting possibilities, and we cannot wait to see what the future holds for ourselves and see what Heather and her team will bring to the brand going forward. It has been a privilege to share our creative vision with so many, and we cannot thank you enough for your support over the years. Uh, goodbye, and thank you for 10 amazing years. And you can see they're getting a lot of comments from other uh, pattern companies and fans and whatnot. Now, I'll, in complete disclosure, I, I don't think I've ever purchased one of their patterns. I can't remember if I have, and I don't think I've purchased anything from Closet Core either. So I am not super, like I, yeah, I'm not super familiar with either of these companies, but I did find it pretty interesting that you're seeing acquisitions within the indie pattern industry. I think that's kind of, I don't know, I, this is the first time I've heard of anything like that. Have you ever heard of anything like that? I don't know. So I saw this. So let's check out what their blog says. All right, so it says, A new era, Deer and Doe is joining the Closet Core Patterns family. Okay, so kind of the same, this is sort of the same thing as they had on their Instagram. So it says, Looking ahead, when we first began discussing uh, possible, okay, I don't need to know, like, the whole story. Okay, Heather Lou. Okay, so it looks like they will continue um, the customer service for the existing patterns. And it looks like they're going to publish new patterns under the brand. I don't know who's designing the new patterns. Romantic, feminine, and timeless designs. Okay, there's also an, okay, okay. Heather from Closet Core also did a blog. Okay, they got a new employee as a customer service coordinator. Okay, so everything's moving over to the Closet Core website. So if you do have a deer and doe uh, pattern, it looks like that's that's the deal. Uh, let's see if they have the pattern. Okay, so if you go to the shop thing, it goes straight to the Closet Core uh, website. So this is where you can now find the Closet Core or the deer and doe patterns. So here's some of the patterns. I mean, they're kind of cute. I have not made. Also, is it just me or have patterns, indie patterns gotten more expensive? I don't know. Like, these are cute. $16 is kind of a lot of money. So this is sort of their main thing. I feel like I've seen some of the patterns before, but I have not purchased any of the patterns before. I don't know if you guys... They're sort of cute. The, that water lily jacket, that looks kind of, that actually looks kind of easy. All right, let's check out this one. All right, guys. And, all right, oh, this is, 
Okay, this is in French. Did I, I think I accidentally clicked on the French one. I don't know. Okay, yeah, I accidentally got it in French, but okay. I actually kind of like that jacket. It looks pretty, looks pretty wearable and it looks kind of forgiving. I don't know. What do you guys think? Uh, all right, so, and let's take a look at Heather. I want to see this, uh, Heather's blog post, too. Let's see. Okay, so they think. Okay, and here's a frequently asked question. So if you do have any questions about the patterns. Okay, oh, it does say prices have increased slightly, so they are more consistent with existing. Okay, so they raise the prices a bit. Existing closet core patterns. Okay, they have standardized Euro and UK pricing. Interesting. Okay, there are no paper patterns for now. All right, that's interesting. But yeah, I have not heard of acquisitions before. You know, I don't know what the dollar figures involved or anything like that. But I do think that's, I don't know, I think that's kind of interesting. All right, let me see if I can find Heather. Okay, so here is the blog post from, okay, from Closet Core Patterns. Let's check this out. This is welcome, a uh, deer and doe to the Closet Core family. Hold on to your hats, folks. Today's announcement is a big one. We are delighted and excited to announce that the iconic French pattern brand Deer and Doe is joining the Closet Core family. As of today, you'll now be able to shop for Deer and Doe patterns exclusively on our website. Okay, they go into the most. Okay. And I'll be real, like, I. I don't know if I need to know all the backstory about the relationship or anything. Okay, so it looks like the founders of Deer and Doe have had some personal difficulties. Which, again, I can see that would make running a business, a small business, difficult. All right, so Camille and Elle. Again, I don't really know these people, but I did find that. I just saw the announcement of the acquisition. Okay, so it looks like, okay, it looks like Camille has had some pretty serious health issues. I, this makes a lot of sense. Again, if you're having some personal, if you're going through some personal issues or medical things, yeah, that might, yeah, I can definitely see, I can definitely see that uh, causing some challenges. That's rough, man. That is really rough. Okay. This is Ele so that's Camille. What happened to Eleanor? Okay, they okay, so they published a book. Actually, yeah, some of their patterns are cute. Now I'm kind of interested. Okay, okay, so this, here's the thing. And this is something that a lot of people who are self-employed or who have a small business run into is we both went through periods of severe burnout and depression. I, I feel that. I really do. Especially when it's like just you or just you and a partner. Also, I think partnerships can be challenging altogether on a whole other level too. So it says, wow, it is under these circumstances. Okay, I, I, I'm kind of, let's read this. Let's read this. I'm curious. So it says this, and this is from like years ago. So this post is from two years ago in July of 2022. So they've been doing this for 12 years. So, I mean, that's a really long time. I mean, I've only been a content creator for like six years. So only about half the length. And, you know, I haven't had extreme burnout or, or depression but there are certainly periods where it's tough for sure that's pretty rough okay so I can this is making more sense to me okay uh so it says uh this is written by Eleanor Camille and I are two perfectionists and we have consistently constantly pushed ourselves to provide the most flawless work possible uh this has come at the expense of counting our hours requiring us to draw ever more from our reserves and arrive at the launch of our patterns totally exhausted. Over time, it became increasingly difficult for us to find the energy to communicate about our daily lives, our work, and of course, our patterns, and we gradually lost our voice. There were no personal creations, a lack of behind-the-scenes updates. All our time was spent and is still spent on the development of patterns and uh, sewing to prototypes collection after collection. All right, so it says, we both went through periods of severe burnout and depression, it is under these circumstances that we both experienced periods of severe burnout. I'm on the autism spectrum, and Camille suffers from clinical depression. I appreciate their openness uh, about what they're going through. 
The combination of our work pace, growing market expectations, and pressures of mounting and contradictory demands on social media, that's a big one, pushed us beyond our limits. We both spent weeks in survival mode, unable to get out of bed, and Camille was sent to an, oh my gosh, inpatient psychiatric care. Holy crap. Wow, that's a lot. We became sick, exhausted by the rhythm of keeping up. We realized that we could no longer continue. I was not, like, guys, I was not um, expecting this at all. Like, exhausted by the rhythm of keeping up, we realized we could no longer continue on this path without the risk of losing our physical and mental health. Wow, that's, that's pretty rough. Wow. All right. So 2022, not a good time for... Eleanor and Camille. Wow. All right. So it says, as we come to a close of wrapping up our first 10 years of business, we are so proud of what we have achieved. We feel grateful to all of you. It says, sometimes it takes a lot of courage to be vulnerable. And we hope this article has spoken to you. We are currently hard at work on the autumn winter collection, which will accompany our 10th anniversary. Wow. That's, yeah, that's, oh, wait, you know what? Sorry. Sorry, guys, I realized I was not even sharing that tab. Sorry. Okay. Sorry, guys. All right, so this is the tab. Oh, wait, is this it? Sorry, I think I forgot to share. Uh, guys, sorry, I forgot to share the tab sometimes. Okay, so this is the article about them dealing with severe burnout and depression on the Deer and Doe blog. Sorry, guys, I forgot to share that tab. I mean, that's a lot. And here's the thing, like... When you have a small business or you're any sort of influencer or you, you know, or you're like a solo content creator, uh, the pressures on social media are pretty, pretty vast because social media is pretty much a requirement for you to do if you're a content creator or if you're a small business because that's how you, that's a big part of the marketing and it can be really, it can be very overwhelming and it, it feels like you're on a constant hamster wheel. So I can understand how you could feel a lot of pressure to do constant social media. So yeah, I can definitely, I can definitely relate to some of, some of these, uh, some of their struggles. Now, again, I have not obviously dealt with anything near this level, um, but I can say it's, it's rough. Like being self-employed or having a small business is not, probably not for most people. So I can really understand what these folks are going through. All right, let's go back to the Closet Core blog. All right, so it says, oh wait, sorry. There we go. So, okay. So they had some personal difficulties and they had come to recognize they no longer had the bandwidth to keep sustainably running a deer and doe. You know, that's hard to, like, that's hard to admit. That's hard to, I think, become self-aware about and realize that's happening. All right. After much thought and discussion, they came to the difficult realization that it was time to sell the company. Wow. Wow. That's a lot. Because of my relationship with Camille and our existing structure of bilingual pattern support in both English and French, uh, they thought Closet Core would be the best fit. As a result, we were the only company they approached last November to see if they would be interest, we would be interested in taking over. Uh, selling a business you put your heart and soul into is an incredibly hard decision, and I was gobsnap, gobsmacked when I received that first email from Camille. Uh, Deer and Doe started the same year as Closet Core, and I've long admired the brand. They embodied the chic French, I cannot, je, je ne sais quoi style that mesmerizes us North Americans. They are known for their excellent instructions and beautiful romantic designs. Uh, nobody does special occasion dresses better. I've made D&D &D patterns over the years and have always looked forward to their collection releases. To be chosen as the steward to take that history and spirit into the future is an incredible honor. Okay. Let's see. And I, yeah, again, I've not bought Closet Core either. Closet Core has grown a lot in the last 10 years. I started this company alone in my apartment in Montreal. Okay, and we've grown from just me to a creative, vibrant, and dedicated team of eight, plus six more folks at uh, Core Fabrics. Okay. 
Okay, so they have a fabric store as well. Since launching the fabric store and a monthly pattern membership called Crew, I've grown a lot as a leader and our team has gotten tighter. Okay, I think that's interesting, you know, and it's cool that, you know, if the folks behind Deer and Doe wanted to exit their business, it looks like the, like they found a really good um, exit strategy in selling what they built and being able to do something else. I don't know. I'm curious to see what they'll do. I wonder what they'll be doing like after this. I don't know. Let's see if it says anything on the other blog post. So, I mean, hey. Yeah, I don't know what they're planning to do next. Um, okay, so here's some frequently asked questions. Okay. A lot of people commenting. Well, here's the thing. So, when they were saying that they had to focus all on the business and weren't able to do a lot of personal projects, that's something I can relate to, to as well. Like, because when you have to produce content or do anything like that, when it becomes, when what you like doing becomes a business, you end up working on all of the business stuff and then you're not really able to do the fun stuff. Like when I'm doing a video about a sewing project, I would say like all in all, probably like 10 to 15% of my time is actually spent making the project. And the other 85% is on, you know, planning out the production, filming the project, doing like the editing takes longer than the sewing. The editing takes just as long or if not longer. Doing all the social media stuff, doing photos, like doing everything associated with the content production. And that's what really adds so much, that adds so much more work onto just making the project. So I d can definitely relate to them saying that, you know, they had to spend all of their time on the business stuff, like putting out new patterns and whatnot. And they weren't able to, they weren't really able to spend a lot of time on what they actually like doing. There's a lot of computer work. I'm sure there's a lot of that, probably emails, doing business negotiations, all that stuff. So, but I do think it's interesting that they sold their company. Like they didn't just shut it down. They sold it to another company that will be able to continue on their legacy um, and let them walk away without having to continue to do the maintenance or like do customer service for all of that stuff. So I think it's pretty interesting. Uh, but what do y'all think? Let's read some comments here. Oh, thank you very much, Vanessa. I've watched a few of your live videos. I enjoy them. Thank you. I hope Closet Core follows their pattern block, a deer and doe draft, especially for a pear-shaped body type. Okay, that's kind of me too, so maybe I should check them out, which is not common among the indie pattern companies. I'm probably more like apple or pear-shaped, so that actually sounds pretty, that sounds pretty good to me. I've seen higher prices for indie patterns. Yeah, I've seen higher too, but I've just noticed over time, I feel like the prices have kind of crept up with the indie pattern companies. Uh, I've made Closet Core's free t-shirt pattern and really like it. It's a nice all-around boxy t-shirt pattern. Y'all have to check them out because I haven't, like I've heard of them, but I, there's, the other thing is that there's so many indie pattern companies now that it's, I feel like it's hard to keep track of all of them. All right, uh, the big four regular prices are normally between $16 and $25. Indie patterns can have blocks for different cup sizes and video guides. That's true. So here's the thing. I think for me, I find I'm okay with paying more for indie pattern companies if they're providing a lot more than the big four. Like, again, a so long, a complete so long video, um, all, like very detailed instructions. If they can do that, then I would say like, yeah, I'll shell out more money. I'm very cheap though, so it's kind of it's kind of hard, especially when I have a ton of patterns that I got for like three dollars. You know, it can be it can be in comparison that can look pretty expensive. Uh, Closet core Cali shirt, Cal shirt is pretty popular. Yeah, exactly. Like I had no idea. Like that's that's quite a roller coaster there for sure. Like I did no, I had no idea. All right, Denise says, wow, I appreciate seeing behind a curtain. As a viewer, I sometimes feel a lot of pressure to keep up reading feeds. Uh, something needs to change on both sides. That's a really good point because, and this is something I want to get into later when we get to the main topic, is that it's like, like everything's going at such a fast pace that it's like, 
even as content consumers, there's like too much out there. Like we can't, we have a hard time keeping, I have a hard time keeping up with like shows or YouTube channels. And I would be, like, I feel like if collectively there was just less, I think it would be a better pace for consumption. I don't know. So I agree with you. I agree with you here. Let me get some water real quick. See, I did not know that about, I didn't know that about deer and doe patterns, but I do think that's very, very interesting here. All right, oops, I, okay. But yeah, what do you guys think? Are, have you heard, like, I've heard of deer and doe patterns. I've just not tried their stuff before. I'm also not French, so I can't, yeah, I definitely can't pronounce the French stuff. That's for sure. That is for sure. <laughs> But I wish them, Camille and uh, Eleanor, I wish you the best. And I really hope that, I, I really hope that you can find more like balance in your life. It sounds like you need it. It sounds like you guys need a break. And I really hope that you get some time to like regroup and, you know, regroup and kind of be able to like take a, take a slower pace for a while. It's okay. So, and again, I don't know what the, you know, finances are, like any of the terms, but yes, this is the big news. So the big news is that they were selling the company. So, but pretty interesting though. So, and I imagine Closet Core will also get like all the social media accounts and all of that stuff. So, but yeah, I haven't really tried the patterns before. Now I'm curious though, they are really cute. I don't wear jumpsuits. Like, here's the thing. I don't wear jumpsuits and dresses a lot. So that's where it's kind of hard. Like, I I just don't need a lot of these garments. And I don't particularly like sewing something. This I could maybe see wearing. Okay, that's kind of cute. What is that? The, okay, eucalyptus dress. Okay, so if it's, if it's like a pear shape, that's kind of my, my thing. So maybe I'll give them a chance, you know, again, maybe I'll give it a, give it a chance. I wonder if they're going to be on the uh, Ditto Pattern Projector, if they're one of the participating uh, indie pattern, you know, uh, indie pattern companies that are participating in, in the Ditto, Ditto, I don't know. All right, so what is that? Orage, Okay. I don't do the square now the square necklines don't really tend to work for me. That shirt dress is kind of cute though. Okay, eucalyptus yeah, jumpsuits are not for me. I do really like that neckline, the neckline of the eucalyptus though. So yeah, maybe I'll try out again. I know they're selling now, but maybe I'll try out some of their patterns now. Okay, the eucalyptus jumpsuit and then the camellia blouse. What's the camellia blouse? Okay, that's, okay, I, I'm not a huge, I'm not huge into the Peter Pan neckline. I like the sleeves, though. So some of these are pretty cute. Maybe I'll give them a shot, I don't know. So that is what's going on with uh, Deer and Doe Patterns. They are selling the company to Closet Core Patterns. So Closet Core Patterns will be taking over all of their stuff. Okay, oh, and they also have a French, they, they have a French Instagram. Yeah, I, that, that's definitely not for me here. So. All right, hello, life, life so BZ. Hello, Jen, it's been a while since I watched your live. It was nice seeing you again. Hope all went well with you. Thank you for, for watching. We're just catching up on what is happening. And, like, the big topic tonight, so... This is, this has kind of caught the internet by storm this week. And you may not have, you may not have seen what was going on because it's kind of in another space. But this does have a lot of, 
overlap, I think, with what happens in the sewing industry and the sewing community. And that is why I wanted to get into it. So if you have not heard, I'll bring up this article and it's linked in the description box as well. I want to bring up this article and talk about it and really get into what this means for content and for uh, social media. All right, so this article is from Morning Brew. And it says, can a product review be too harsh? Some say star product review YouTuber Marquez Brownlee was too hard on Humane's AI pin. So I'm going to go through the article and then we'll get into what that means for us because this does have, I think a lot of, it res- I think it can resonate a lot with us as well. All right. So it says, this article is by Sam Klebanov. A futuristic AI-powered wearable that aims to help humanity kick its smartphone addiction was about as critically acclaimed as the restaurants on Kitchen Nightmares. Okay, that's a funny starting line. But the AI pin, billed as a screenless assistant by the much-hyped startup Humane, got people talking after its evisceration by the famously straight-shooting product review guru Marquez Brownlee, a.k.a. MKBHD. In a video titled, The Worst Product I've Ever Reviewed, For Now, which received over 6 million views, he praised the gadget's sleek design and clever charging system, but criticized everything else, from its inconsistent battery life to its inability to sync with a smartphone. But then the YouTuber himself got a thumbs down in the form of a viral X post from former Amazon Web Services engineer Daniel Vassallo, who accused Brownlee of chasing clicks at Humane's expense and called the video's title distasteful, almost unethical. Brownlee pushed back, saying that he was simply doing his job of educating viewers about a product before they shell out $699 plus a $24 monthly subscription fee for it. The back and forth stirred up a conversation about what reviewers owe to their audiences and the companies whose products they feature. Here's an unboxing of that discourse. Anti-humane rhetoric accusation. Vassalo's main complaint seems to be that someone with Brownlee's reach could undermine a plucky upstart on the bleeding edge of the AI revolution, like Humane, by trashing its first product. Vassalo maintained that Brownlee's 18 million YouTube followers obligated him to be mindful of how his choice of words could harm a company. He claimed that Brownlee chose the sensationalist video title to do maximum damage, though he later clarified to TechCrunch that he found the review itself fair and balanced. Other tech industry veterans agreed. Entrepreneur Alex Kerr said that the review was devastating to the, for the future of Humane, as it'll destroy sales. Tech influencer Alex Finn also wrote that Brownlee used his immense influence to erect the company's gravestone. Indeed, Humane was banking on its smartphone supplanter being a hot commodity after it raised $230 million in venture capital funding and expected to sell 100,000 pins in the first year. This isn't the first time a company's misfortunes have been pinned on Brownlee's panning. Some think his recent review of the Fisker Ocean SUV, this is the worst car I've ever reviewed, is a reason the EV startup is on the brink of bankruptcy. Reviewer not responsible. MKBHD replied to the charge that he's a company valuation destroyer with a follow-up video in which he stated that it's not bad reviews but bad products that drive companies out of business. Brownlee reminded viewers that Fisker was already in dire straits and known to be at risk of getting delisted from the New York Stock Exchange before he reviewed the car. He claimed that negative reviews can only accelerate the demise of a company, not precipitate, precipitate it. Also not salty about the AI pin review, Humane itself. The company's head of new media, Sam Sheffer, said MKBHD's critiques were fair and valid, while assuring that the startup was listening and learning. Plus, MKBHD's defenders pointed out that he's just one voice in a chorus of AI pin haters. 
other prominent YouTubers engaged in similar clickable dunking on the product, and most tech sites agreed that it was more of a glitchy gimmick than a game changer. Fellow tech analysts like Ben Thompson contend that MKBHD has no obligations to anyone other than his trusting audience, the greatest source of his power. Big picture, since a large chunk of the product reviews on e-commerce sites are considered unreliable or even sponsored by sellers, many shoppers are increasingly counting on the level-headed input of vloggers like MKBHD, which raises their profile as well as questions about their responsibilities. So I saw this kind of going down on X this week, and there were a lot of good questions that were brought up about uh, product reviews and like, basically it's like, should you be, should you be nice about them? Should you have any uh, duty to be, you know, give the company that makes the, these products the benefit of the doubt? And there were other questions, too, about whether uh, Marquez kind of went too far with uh, the title of his video. So I'll show you the video here. All right, let me just, uh, well, here was his follow-up video. So, but let me show you the, let me show you the actual video. Let's see here. And I will say, I, I'm not super into, like, tech YouTube uh, but I've watched enough of Marquez's content uh, to to say that I think he's a very, I think he's somebody you should, as, if you're going to be a content creator who does reviews and talks about products, I think he's definitely someone you should aspire to be like. I think his reviews are very fair. They're very well researched. He puts a lot of thought into the content. He really tests them out and he gives I think very like very authentic reviews and I really appreciate him as a creator I think his videos are amazing I think he's an awesome youtuber and I think he's someone that you could you could see uh, he seems trustworthy and he's someone that really does seem to be creating the content in good faith and not just for clicks not just for views um, it's pretty obvious that this is someone that genuinely wants to create a uh, good content all right, so here is MKBHD's channel here. Okay, so, and he's been doing YouTube for, like, ever. Um, he started doing it when he was a kid, and, like, literally, he's, like, 12 years old or something. I think he's in his 20s. He's a pretty young guy. And what I really appreciate about him is that he's become one of the foremost tech reviewers. Uh, you know, he has as much clout as, like, a, like a major media publication at, at this point. He's got 18.7 million subscribers. And this is... All right, so this... This is the video he did. Uh, so it was called The Worst Product I've Ever Reviewed for Now. And so this is... It was this like wearable AI pin. Apparently it kind of sucks and it doesn't do what it's supposed to do. It's 700 bucks. And it's like, it's got a $24 a month subscription, which is a fairly expensive. So this is the review. So it now has about 6.5 million views. And here's the thing. So the title is called The Worst Product I've Ever Reviewed uh, for Now. So is this something that is going to be enticing to click on? Absolutely. But at the same time, he's a YouTuber. Like, this is, like... I would say this, I don't think it's clickbait if your video delivers on the promise of the video title and the thumbnail. It's clickbait if the video has nothing to do with what you, like, if this, if if his title said, like, the worst product on earth, and then you clicked on it, and it was a really great product, you'd be like, this is very misleading. But he really genuinely believes that this is, like, the worst product is reviewed. So, is I think as long as he's being honest about his real opinions, I don't have a problem with that title at all. And he also did a follow-up video after all of this, like, you know, after, like, all of the commotion over his video, he did a follow-up video uh, called Do, Review, Do Bad Reviews Kill Companies. And 
he had a lot of good points in here and I actually agree like I pretty much agree with everything in his video I have linked his video down below in the description box if you want to check it out I've also linked uh, another guy named Asmund Gold who reacted to his reaction video and um, so he points out a few things in in these videos that I just think I want to touch on so he was asking well so first of all I want to say that he's at a fairly large level so it's hard to like okay so he's at the level where he has a huge amount of he's a huge audience he's millions and millions of people he's also at the level where he can afford to purchase products he reviews but he also has the leverage to push back on companies so when you're starting out and you're like a smaller influencer you're a smaller content creator you either have to purchase products yourself to review or you could try to get a company to send you products you're probably not going to get a sponsored you're probably not going to get a lot of sponsored videos if you only have like 2,000 YouTube subscribers or something uh, but at his level he not only now has enough revenue where he could easily purchase anything he wants to review but he's going to get companies massive companies like apple or this company to just send him stuff and he has the leverage that he can accept it like he can just say hey you can send me stuff but you get like there are no guarantees and i think that's a good position to be in and i think that it's often creators like marquez brownlee who have such a massive reach and have a lot of leverage that can also be in the best position to do honest reviews because like these companies that are making the products and want to get their products into his hands um they know he's probably getting a lot of stuff sent to him and they also know that he can tell them to kick rocks but they want like even if he said like i'm you know i want to say whatever i want about the product they would still send it anyways just on the off chance he features it because it's such a massive publicity opportunity massive marketing for every company that gets featured by him because he's so big in this space i gotta get some water real quick so he says in his follow-up video uh do bad reviews kill companies he talks about his origins and he actually started off his YouTube journey by reviewing products and by showing people how to use products and he says he makes reviews for viewers he does not make review videos for companies and for brands and he also points out that if a review isn't honest it's useless and I agree with this if you are doing a review and you can't actually say what you really think of the product because you're afraid of hurting the brand or you're afraid of stepping on toes, then how valuable is that review if you are not saying, if you're not keeping it 100? So, yeah. If, if you can't keep it 100, then it's not, you're, you might as well just not put out the content. All right, let's read some comments real quick and then we'll, I, I have, I have a lot of thoughts on this, but let's read your comments as well. Okay. Uh, independent product reviews are key. Yes, influencers who are. Yeah. I follow Marquez Brownlee. He seems to do honest reviews. Exactly. Sounds like the companies that get bad reviews are blaming Marquez for their crappy products. Right, Lisa? Exactly. I'm fine with the title. It reflects his opinion and experience. And yeah, and he was, here's the thing. He wasn't the only one that had these experiences. He actually said the behind the scenes, he was in contact with other tech tubers asking if, like, he's like, maybe it's just me. And he found out through the grapevine that a lot of other people were having the same issues with this AI pin that he was. So it wasn't just him. The product has a lot of issues. And when you're selling somebody a $700 wearable AI pin, you know, I think these tech tubers do have a responsibility to their viewers to be 100% and be honest and be transparent because that's a lot of money to spend on some freaking wearable AI pin, right? 
This is very interesting. Consumers need independent reviews to fairly evaluate whether a product is for them or not. Exactly. So, yeah. I remember when Andy Rooney did a product review on a 60 Minutes segment. He proved the product did not work as advertised and the company sued him. Andy won. Yes. They sent the product to him and he tried it out and gave his honest opinion. And that, you know what? That's what people should be doing. That is what people should be doing. Yep. When influencers receive some type of benefit from a company to push their product, the consumer does not receive a fair review. Thank you, Nancy. It's one reason I love to listen to you, Jen. You maintain your independence. I wish more people did. I consider reviews where you receive a benefit from the company to all be tainted and worthless. People crave honest reviews. And look, I know I might ruffle some feathers by some of my opinions on this because a lot of other influencers in this space, again, it's it's kind of a conflict of interest and they're going to be like, oh no, it's totally fine. I, I don't agree with that. I think, okay. <laughs> Okay, oh, my hubby has an AI pin coming. I hope it's not that humane one, so it'll be interesting to see how it works. So in this video, Marquez, so he talks about how if the review is not honest, it's worthless. And he, so here's the thing, he is at the point where he can do what he wants because he's at such a big level that the companies producing these products can't ignore him and they're still going to send him free products just regardless, you know, because they want to get it, you know, they want to get it to him. So he has kind of an interesting situation. And he also says that when he is creating content, again, you know, he doesn't really think about the company because the review is not for the company. The review is for his audience and his viewers. And, I just really check out this video and also check out the review to the to the reaction to the reaction uh, by this guy Asmund Gold because I thought he had some good thoughts too. I know this is like a reaction to the review follow up and Asmund Gold talks about how a lot of people that review products have, in his opinion, have been like compromised, like they've been they're being paid by the companies to review these products, and in my opinion. That's not an actual review. So I, I've i linked both of these videos. Highly encourage you to check them out, even though you might not be in the tech space. I think both of them had some really interesting uh, points to make about content creation and making review videos or making videos where you're giving opinions on like products or services. So here's my, all right, here's, and I will say this, and you, I have had these stances for quite a while, and I'm not going to be changing them, but this is definitely, again, I've been a content creator for about six years. I make a lot less money because of the type of content I do. That's just a fact. Because it's hard for, it's very hard for me to do sponsorships or do, like, collaborations because a lot of the brands I encounter in the sewing industry don't want to they don't want to create authentic content they want me to create a commercial for the brand that's disguised as content and that's the issue I've run into a lot over the years uh, so I'm going to be talking about that because I have a lot of I have a lot of gripes with the way influencer marketing has affected sewing content online. And yeah, I will be, if you have any questions about it, leave them in the chat or leave them in the comments because I have some, I've got some unpopular opinions and I've had some other influencers reach out to me and they were mad, they were definitely not happy with what I've been talking about. Um, I've had some of them be like, I get products for free all the time and I'm always 100%, I'm like, right, right, okay there. So, Here's my thoughts. If the company has any input or involvement in the content itself, it's not a review. It's just not. So when I'm doing reviews on products, I try to make sure that my experience as a customer is the same or is the close to being the same as a regular customer as, I, as possible. So that means 
and again, I've, I have this on the work with me page on sewingreport.com. I've had this policy in place for about six years because early on in my, you know, YouTube journey, I had a couple pretty negative experiences with companies. So here are my official policies. I do not do paid product reviews, paid service reviews, and I... I have a very hard time accepting free products at this point. And I'll tell these companies, if they reach out and they offer to send me a free product, I say, hey, you can send it what you want, but I have absolutely no obligation. You will not get any input on the content. You will, you know, you're not even gonna know if I make content. Like, I'm not gonna update you. I'm not gonna be like, yeah, I'm planning a video. If you wanna send something, you can send it, but just know there are absolutely no guarantees. I can say whatever I want about the product. There is no guarantee. Like a lot of, what a lot of content creators do is the brand will send them a product in exchange for making content. So even though it's not a direct sponsorship, this influencer is accepting the product on the condition that they will make content. And if a brand tries to send me stuff, I say, there is absolutely no deal here. Like, there's no conditions. So if you're going to send me anything, you know, you're welcome to, but, like, there's, out, like, you get nothing from me. Like, there's no, you know, like, you get nothing. So it's up to you if you want to send it. And again, I think that's probably what a lot of companies do with, I, I don't know his business um, model, but... I'm gonna guess that Marquez does something very similar, especially since he has 18 million subscribers. Companies are gonna send him stuff all day long. They because and that's the thing, he has the leverage that he can call those shots. And I do feel like with the main Sewing Report channel, I'm at least at the level. I think once I got to like 50,000 subscribers, that was like the tipping point I felt like where I could push back and say, hey, you're welcome to send this, but again, no guarantees. I get a lot of offers and you know I don't feature everything again I can say whatever I want you know you have no control over the content so if you're comfortable with that send it to me and I'll say this after I write like a lot of these companies I don't even respond to because the products look so shady I'm like no but if a company does if it, like so I will only really correspond to like companies I've heard of, companies with a rep, a good reputation in this space, not the Amazon sellers. I'm done with those people. But when companies, most companies, when I tell them my policies, they just ghost me because, and that's the thing, like they want to, even though they want to send me the product, they want strings attached. And once I tell these companies, there are no strings attached. If you send me something, most of them, don't want that so they just ghost me and they never send anything which is fine with me because honestly I prefer I prefer to feature products that I purchased and obtained on my own like I just prefer that especially for reviews I am not I would never do a I will not do a sponsored review or a paid review and I've kind of gotten away like at this point I think the only types of sponsorships I would accept on this channel or the main channel are like more like podcast style ad reads where the content is separate from the ad read and I've done that a couple times with so tights they sponsored a couple of my videos and they were like the best to work with because they had absolutely no parameters they're like yeah they didn't even tell me what to say um so that was actually a really good partnership because they had not again I think the audience saw there was a clear separation between the content and the ad and the, the sponsor had no control over the content. What I have a problem with now with a lot of the influencer content is that the brand has some control over the content and that's what I have a problem with because if you're, if you're, see, if you're looking up products and you're trying to research what to buy and you see the influencer, if you see it's either sponsored or the influencer was sent the product for free, you're like, you really become distrustful of the content for for good reason. And that's the thing, even if the company sends you a free product and doesn't directly sponsor the influencer, I'll be real, like, if you're not buying something on your own, 
can you really give a 100% authentic review when you didn't buy it? I really don't think you can, especially when you get to the more expensive products. If I got a, if I, like this is an iPhone 13 Pro. If I got this phone for free, this was like $1,100. Is there any way I can give the same review as if I paid for this with my own money? No, there would be no way. This is an expensive product. And if I got an expensive product for free, it would just, it really would impact the content I made about it because again, I didn't have to shell out my own money for it. And that's a big difference. And that's something that I've personally experienced since getting into like the influencer space is that there really is a difference between you paying for an item and you getting it sent by the brand. The other thing is that even if you, even if the video or the content is not sponsored, but the item was gifted, typically, like this is just my experience, typically the brand is like emailing with you. They're asking questions. They're like, when are you publishing a video on it? Like, it's like if you do like a video in exchange for getting a free product, the brand has some involvement in the content that a normal customer does not have. So that's my other issue with even the gifted products is that typically the brand, especially if it's an expensive product, the brand is going to insert themselves into your content, into the content production process somehow. And even if they don't do that, the influencer, even if there are no words said, the influencer knows deep down that if they try, if they say anything critical about the product or if they're not like, like, you know, if they're, if they're totally unfiltered about it and there's some really bad aspects to the product, you can bet your bottom dollar that company is not going to send you any more products in the future. You're off the PR list. They ain't inviting you on those brand trips and you know, they're not going to like play ball with you in the future. So even if there are no words exchanged on like what the expectations are, I would say a lot of influencers will end up kind of self-censoring just to preserve their relationship with the brand. And that's what Marquez was talking about is that, and even Asmin Gold, is that a lot of these influencers are creating content for the brands and they're not creating content for the audience. And that's what I have an issue with. So it's been, it's been tough. You know, I'll, I have a channel with over a hundred thousand subscribers. And if I did a bunch of sponsored content, I'd be making probably double the money, but the content would be much different. The other thing you should know is that when you are doing any deals with a company, with a contract, all of the one, every single contract I have been sent by a company has had a non-disparagement clause, meaning I can't say anything negative about the company. So me doing these cricket videos, these craftsy videos, these brother videos, these domestica coverage, that wouldn't exist if I had a bunch of sponsors. Like I can tell you that. And there's also a, like a non-compete clause. Like there's typically like a category exclusivity. So say I was using, say I was um, sponsored by brother. I couldn't use any other brand sewing machine in videos. And that doesn't work for me because again, I do a lot of videos and live streams where I am reporting on the industry and doing product reviews and using various types of brands. So I can't really do the category exclusivity thing where I use one brand of scissors only because I do, I review all different types and there is no way in hell I'm signing a non-disparagement clause where I can't say anything negative about the company. Because again, say I was sponsored by Joann's, there would have been none of that Joann content. So that's where I, that's where I think a lot of the influencer marketing has sort of gone off the cliff. And one of the issues I have with a lot of the brands, um, I mean, this is, this is happening with a lot of brands in other spaces as well. But what I find is that brands, they want you to do, they want influencers to make reviews, dis, to make um, commercials disguised as reviews or commercials disguised as content. 
And even if they say, like I've had companies say, yeah, we'll send you this, you can say whatever you want. And when I say, yeah, I had some issues with it, they're like, no, don't put that out there. So even if a company says, yeah, we want our influencers to make organic content that's totally honest, they don't actually mean that. They say that, it's like lip service, but they don't actually uh, mean it. Uh, so yeah, I've had some, I've had some real frustrations with a lot of the brands in this particular space. And I think the other thing, and I've seen people kind of chit chat about this online too, is that especially some of the, um, like kind of with what that article was going into with Humane AI, um, like what, I'm sorry, but like what loyalty do I have to some random company? Again, small or large, you know? And I think one thing, one thing that a lot of the sewing community really likes about apps like Backstitch, which I've talked about, is that it's a place where people can leave honest reviews of indie pattern companies. And let's, again, I've noticed some of these indie pattern designers do not take criticism well. Even like constructive criticism, they take any remote criticism as being like cyberbullying or something. You know, but it's like, if people have legitimate criticisms or issues with the products and they're talking about them, one, there's nothing wrong with that. And two, I think that's, that should be taken by the companies where if a lot of people are having an issue with a certain pattern, that company should not be like butt hurt by what people are saying. They should be like, you know what? Yeah, that is a problem and we're going to fix it. And I think that's what Marquez was getting at and what a lot of the folks in the tech world were getting at this week is that his bad review on that humane AI pin the company should just be like you know what thank you for the feedback we're gonna try to make improvements on this product and I think companies in the sewing industry need to take more of that attitude as well instead of be like I got a very passive aggressive email from the brother PR department after I released my brother's sketch videos. And I could tell they were not like super happy about, I could just tell by the tone in the email that they just weren't thrilled about what I was saying about the sketch. And I didn't respond to their email because I was like, I just don't see this going anywhere. I thought the email was kind of like, I thought they were just gonna lecture me or something or be like, ah. So I just didn't, I didn't, I just didn't see the value of talking to them about it. Again, I'm an independent, you know, I'm an independent content creator. I don't have any loyalty to the Brother Corporation. I like a lot of their products. Again, I have a love-hate relationship with the sketch, but it is what it is, you know? All right, let's read some comments and then we'll go into, uh, we'll go more into this. Oh my gosh, Carol's husband bought the humane. All right, Carol, tell your husband to watch that Marquez Brownlee review. Um, Cause it's, yeah, he may wanna, okay. Can he return it? <laughs> it seems like it's pretty bad. All right, Tara's in the house. Hello, Tara. I have only 4,000 subscribers and received a comment recently on an older video that from watching my video, the person decided not to purchase a Cricut and purchased a Silhouette instead. That's awesome, Tara. All right, Joelle says, influencers that get money for peddling products that they don't use, then act like they do and say they are the best. I've seen some of those. I've seen some of those for sure. Uh, that's why I appreciate that you bought the sketch with your own money. And you know what? I'm, I'll say this too. I'm lucky to be in a position where I can afford to purchase products for the channel. You know, I think that's awesome. And a lot of people, especially people with uh, smaller channels are not in that position. So that's why I, I can also see the nuance in this situation because when you're a smaller influencer or a small YouTube creator and you're not making a lot of money from content creation, I can see why you would almost kind of need to rely on getting free products from brands. You know, and I kind of just saw that early on though. Like when I was in that position, the brands would send you free products. I actually had to sign a contract once just to get free products and it had like some crazy terms in it. I'll never do that again. But when you're small, you don't, again, you don't have a lot of leverage to say back to that company, no, I'm not doing that. Or 
I want to change this term. I'm not signing the non-disparagement clause. And I've just noticed that as you get, you know, as you kind of grow and get more of an audience, companies are a bit more willing to play ball with you in terms of the expectations but yeah, when you're, a, and that's why I, I don't blame the content creators or the influencers. I actually put the blame on these companies for creating this type of environment um, to where we're at now. You know, like in a perfect world, I think brands, I think brands, again, if they are sending out free products, they should just send them out, no expectations, no contracts, you know, no like tit for tat. It should be like, hey, we're going to send you this. You do whatever you want with it. And I really respect companies that do that. I've had a few companies that did that. And you know what? I accepted. I said, you know, hey, I appreciate your, uh, you know, open-mindedness and your, like, the fact that you're willing to put yourselves out there without any, any expectations. I also think that I would like to see more brands doing sponsored content, do, do sponsoring more influencers without all of those restrictions. Like, again... If brother said, hey, we'll pay you, you know, I don't know. We'll pay somebody $10,000. You can do whatever you could trash it. And they actually meant it. Again, I still would be like, whatever. The other thing I would think should happen is if companies are going to sponsor content, it, I don't think they should be reviews. Like if brother paid me $10,000 and said, hey, um, we'll pay you ten grand to just show how this product works or something. I don't even know if I would do that, but that would be a lot better than asking me to do a review. Like if you ask somebody to do a video on like how a product works or to go over some of the features or like explain what it is, you know, maybe something like that. But I would also like to see brands get away from integrated content altogether where the sponsorship is the content and go more to that ad read style where the ad is separate from uh, the content. I also think it really depends on what kind of content you are creating. So I had talked a while ago to the ladies of uh, Cow Butt Crunchy's Cosplay, Regan and Scone. They make amazing cosplay creations. And I think their type of content makes a lot more sense for sponsorships because they're not doing reviews on the product. They're just make it like so if they were to be sponsored by like brother or something and they're just making like cosplays like yes they're using the machine but at the same time the content is focused on what they're making and it's not necessarily the machine so i do think it really is highly dependent also on what what kind of video it is you know what i'm saying um for instance like okay so i have this like um all right, so I've got this pink cutting mat right here. You know what I mean? So this cutting mat was made by like uh, U.S. Art Supply. So if U.S. Art Supply said, hey, I'd like to sponsor your live streams, you know, we'll send you a cutting mat and you just have it in the backdrop. I also think that's like less problematic. Again, if it's just like something that you're, you know, or if like this microphone company wanted to sponsor me, I think that would be like, because the microphone is not the content, I think that would be like not as big of a deal to me personally. So I think those types of sponsorships, in my opinion, are like less, you know, kind of like, I don't know. I, I would say that that would bother me less as a consumer than a, than say, um, Apple spot, which I don't even think Apple sponsors anybody because they don't need to, than Apple sponsoring me doing a review of the iPhone, you know. But, like, if it's like, hey, you know, we'll send you a microphone to use during your live streams and we'll be the sponsor. Like, that's the thing. Like, the microphone, the microphone is not the, you know, actual content. So, I, I think it depends on what the content is. But I don't, I really don't like, like, if, if I see a review is sponsored or the person got it for free, I actually click off the video. I'm like, I'm not watching this because this ain't real. And that's the whole point of Marquez's video is that, you know, again, and we're seeing a lot of reviews like that. And you're seeing more and more on like TikTok, Instagram, everywhere, where it's like a paid review or like a paid feature. And you're like, this ain't, this is not legitimate, you know? 
So that's what I, I don't know. So again, some people might not like what I'm saying. That is okay. Uh, this is my opinion. And this is based on being a YouTube creator for the past, uh, for the past eight years. And just the experiences I've had with companies and just what I've dealt with is that these companies, they want, they just want influencers to make commercials for the brand and the brands don't care about the value to the audience. That's my honest opinion. Most of them don't. And that's one of the reasons I actually did do the sponsorship with SoTites is because I felt like we had the same shared values and they weren't like that. So I was like, okay, this is awesome. So that's like the one company I've been able to do a sponsorship with in the past like five years. I don't think I've done a sponsor. Like I before that I had not done a sponsorship in like I think since like 2018 or something. This has been a long time. And it's based on some like kind of negative experiences I had uh, with some of these companies. So if you guys have any questions about that, I will like... I'll let it rip here. I will let it rip because I, I'm kind of fed up with the way things are going. Uh, but when you think about it, like, who are we? Like, if someone does, like, a sponsored review or even a review where you didn't pay for the product, who is that helping? Like, it's helping you because you got a free product. It's helping the brand. But, like, is it really helping the audience? And at what point do you cross the line between being a review and being a commercial for the company? Like, I don't think the brand, like, if you're doing a review, the brand should have absolutely no involvement in the content itself. And that's why I do have a problem with the people getting the gifted products. Because the brand, at that point, does have an involvement in the content. And I don't think you should be doing review videos. I, I just don't like review videos that are sponsored or with free items. May, you know, I guess that's a hot take. I don't know. All right, I got to get some water. I'm going to eat myself real quick. Okay. So yeah, that's just going off on the soapbox here. I like, I got fired up because like, and also like the guy who said that Marquez was unethical for doing an honest review, I'm like, what are you smoking, dude? Like, that guy was nuts. That guy was just nuts. All right, Denise says, I prefer fact-based reviews and less about the infotainment aspect. Generally, I don't trust written reviews and take them with a grain of salt. And when I'm Googling products, you see those, like, random websites where they're, like, top 10, you know, microwaves or something. And you know they're all, like, I don't know, those are sketchy. All of those are sketchy. I, per I watch you because I appreciate your candid honesty. I believe people with 16 million subscribers can absolutely influence others. Uh, there's a fine line between being honest and being harmful. So here's the thing with Marquez. So for the people saying that, like, here's the thing. So some people were saying, you know, he really needs to be, like, more, you know, he, you know, because he has such massive power over these companies, he could be, like, a company killer, that he needs to be responsible with, like, you know, how he's titling his videos or whatever. And here's the thing I would say to that is, one, who, if you don't, like, to the people who are saying that he, you know, need to be more careful or more responsible, who is going to decide what is responsible or what Marquez should be doing with his own platform that he built himself? That random guy who was criticizing him, like, why is he telling Marquez Brownlee what to do? And who decides what is responsible? Like, I just think you can get down the slippery slope of, like, you know, trying to dictate what other people are doing with their platforms that they built themselves. And I do have a problem with, like, I have a problem. Like, if someone, like, I've had some people email me or DM me and they were, like, unhappy with things I've done. And I'm, I just ignore them because I'm like, you're coming into my house and telling me how to conduct myself on the platforms I built is, is disrespectful for one. And then it's also like, who are you? You know, like, who are you? Like, if you don't agree with me, go out and build your own audience and you can say whatever you want to them. But, you know, if like this, like you guys watching, 
you're here because, you know, you're here because you like what I have to say. And if you didn't, you wouldn't be here. But at the same time, imagine if somebody came. How would you feel if you found out that somebody else was like telling me what to do? You know, it'd be very weird. So that's why I found it odd that so many people were like, so many people that don't have 18 million subscribers like Marquez were trying to tell him what to do. It's like, you know what? I feel like he's probably in the best position as the guy who actually built that audience to how, as to how he should be conducting himself. Um, and I, I didn't have a problem with the title at all. And he also brought up this point is that when he is doing reviews, especially about companies that like people might not have heard of before, like a lot of people before, like a lot of people did not know what this AI pin was before he did the review. And he also says that he has to title the videos. Oh, wait, let me go back to the, all right, sorry, we're on the, uh, we're actually on the reaction to the reaction. But he, Marquez was saying that when he's doing products that are a little bit more obscure, like this humane AI pin was kind of an obscure product. He has to kind of title the videos to get a wider interest. Like, imagine if he just called the video, like, Review of Humane's AI Pin. He's got 18 million subscribers, and a lot of them won't, won't watch it because they're like, well, this isn't relevant to me. But they will click on the video if it says, you know, the worst product I've ever reviewed. So he also has to think of his wider audience not just the people that are interested in buying the humane AI pin, which is probably a relatively number, small number of people, but he also has to catch the interest of a wider audience, a w much wider group of people, not necessarily just the people who will purchase uh, this AI pin. So I thought I would definitely encourage you watch his video because I thought he had a lot of, um, you know, good things to say. All right, let's uh, let's read some more comments here. Oh, thank you, Lisa. Your honesty and integrity shines. Through. And that's the thing. Like, if I didn't have that, like, if I just started shilling products left and right and doing paid reviews, like, you guys would stop watching the channel. Like, let's be real. Like, no one would watch anymore because people would be like, this isn't what I signed up for, you know? Oh, hi, Bex from Texas. Thank you. Yeah, it makes it difficult to know what to believe, you know? And I thought Mark has had a good point. Like, Again, some people were saying his title was, like, irresponsible or something. But, you know, again, his his job as a YouTuber is to get views on the video. And I don't think it's wrong to title the video in a way to maximize the viewership. I don't think there's anything wrong with that. All right. Uh, in some cases, it's like brands develop products with no input from actual consumers so when reviews are negative, they shouldn't be surprised. You know what? That is, that's a really good comment, Leneva. And, you know, and that is something uh, somebody else brought up about Marquez Brownlee's review of the AI pin was that this company should be thankful that someone like him basically gave them like a free consult, like a free, you know, like a lot of companies pay a lot of money to get people to get consultations like that. And uh, Marquez gave them that feedback for free. You know, they didn't have to pay anybody. Uh, if it's a sponsored review, I don't watch. Same, Lisa. Uh, same. All right, what about videos, tutorials, where they say, we're making X using the X machine materials? Uh, that might be okay. I would say, like, I would say that would definitely air more on the side of, like, it wouldn't bother me, you know? Like, again, my like our friends at Cow Butt Crunchy's Cosplay, if they're making, like, a dress... And the video is about making the dress and they happen to be using a certain sewing machine and it's sponsored. Like that really wouldn't, like that really wouldn't bother me because the sewing machine is not like the main focus of the content. It's the making process of like the dress. So I, I would say that would be like more on the line of being like, you know, not problematic the other thing about them, too, is that they don't do this these types of shows where they will be, like, critiquing a company. So it kind of depends. Like, again, I do a lot of reporting on the industry, so it would be kind of tough to get a sponsor because what if... Here's the thing. We saw this during the cricket debacle 
where a lot of the cricket influencers couldn't say anything about what was going on with the cricket policy that everybody hated because I'm sure they had a non-disparagement clause. So one thing that getting um, influencers in your like stable there, it kind of keeps a muzzle on them so they can't say anything if shit hits the fan. So that is probably one reason why brands like getting influencers kind of on board, like giving them an ambassadorship or a sponsorship is because if they can get the influencer to sign that non-disparagement clause, that influencer is never going to say anything bad about the company. And that's why I can't really sign those types of deals is because I need to be able to have the freedom to say anything about anything. So I can't sign, like with this type of content, I can't sign a non-disparagement ag agreement. All right, I do reviews for Wayfair. I tell the truth and they ask you to be truthful. See, those are different too because those are like specific. Yeah, I've seen those and, you know, here's the thing though. That's like for a platform. You're like, you're not, I see that as being a very different thing. I, I know what you're talking about, but those, I would put that in a different category, you know. Yeah, you know, yeah, Bex, that's, that's a very different thing. Like, you're writing reviews, like, Wayfair wants more reviews on the site, so that's why they're, like, sending you the stuff. Um, that's a lot different than if you had, like, a YouTube channel with 18 million subscribers and you were being paid to review products on your channel. So that's a much different thing. Like, there's nothing, there's really nothing wrong with that. All right, uh, Denise says, it seems every channel is sponsored these days, but you're right, no company really wants an honest, constructive review. Some of them will say they do, but they don't. They Like, in my experience, they don't mean it all. Like, they're just saying it to sound good, but they don't actually, they don't actually mean it. Reviews are written by AI for AI now. Okay, first, last, that's, okay, that's all, that's hilarious. Uh, when going online, we have to be comfortable with some criticism. I think you influence and inform with integrity. Well, thank you, Tara. Uh, companies can always build up their own following to compete. You know, Lisa, that is something they could do. You know, and then you you could just put out your own thing, you know. So, but that's the thing. A lot of these companies don't have, some of the, especially the smaller companies, you know, they don't have as much of a platform, you know. So, they're trying to use other people's audiences. All right, we've got uh, Roxanne from Twitch. Welcome. Welcome. We have, might have like one Twitch viewer here. All right, titles are supposed to draw people in. They should be more sensational. And that's the thing. Like, Marquez, again, he does informational videos, but they're also supposed to appeal to a wide number of people. So if he titled the video just something boring, like Humane AI pin released or something, he would probably get a fraction of the views as the title, the worst product I've ever reviewed for now. And the people who had a problem with like, the people who had a problem with the title, I'm just like, I, yeah, I don't even know what to, I, I was just like, you've got to be kidding me. you got to be kidding me. But shout out to Marquez, because he definitely got a lot of publicity himself uh, from all of the hubbub over his review. <laughs> but that's the thing, in his review, I saw most of it. It wasn't even like, like, it wasn't me. It, like, he was just very, like, matter of fact about it like and that's how he is in all of his reviews he's not overly sensational about the review it's like he's not like trashing the company or saying anything like super rude about it or anything so i just thought that was kind of interesting um but let me let's see if i can play like i don't want to get copyright claim but i'll play like a tiny bit of this hold on a second let's see here okay here we go so let's see, hopefully you can hear this. Okay. Any good or not, how well it actually worked and if their honest opinion is if it's good, then that's the review. If it's bad, that's the review. That's basically it. And so I've been an advocate of good independent reviews for what feels like forever now. But the thing about reviews is if they're not honest, then they're basically useless. I really strongly feel like everything that comes... See, exactly, like, and that's the thing. There are so many fake reviews on YouTube. They're everywhere from influencers who got the product for free or who are sponsored by the company. 
and it's not actually a review. It, that's not a review, you know? And I've even seen, I've even seen a lot of influencers not disclose their business relationship with the companies they're working with. And that is a problem. All right, let me pull this up for you guys. So there is, here in the United States and a lot of other countries have something equivalent to the Federal Trade Commission, uh, but the FTC has guidelines for influencers to follow it. And I'll be real with you, I see a lot of influencers who are not properly disclosing their relationships with products and companies. So this is the FTC guidelines for social media influencers. And you and the brand can get fined if you do not follow all of these uh, uh, guidelines here. These aren't, and by the way, these are not suggestions. This is the law. So here are all the tips on what you're, like, so it says when to disclose. Disclose when you have a financial, employment, personal, or family relationship with a brand. Financial relationships aren't limited to money. Disclose the relationship if you got anything of value to mention a product. That includes a discount on something. That includes like you getting a free item. It includes you being an affiliate program. I'm in a few affiliate programs myself. If a brand gives you free or discounted products or other perks, and then you mention one of its products, make a disclosure even if you weren't asked to mention that product. Don't assume your followers already know about your brand relationships. Make disclosures even if you think your evaluations are unbiased. Yep, see? If posting from abroad, U.S. law applies if it's reasonably foreseeable that the post will affect U.S. consumers. Foreign laws might also supply. So it says if you have no brand relationship and are just telling people about a product you bought and happen to like, you don't need to declare that you don't have a brand relationship. So this is what you're supposed to be doing. And I will see, I will, I have noticed a lot of people not doing disclosures. And again, they may not get caught. You know, again, I don't, the, the enforcement on this is fairly inconsistent. But this is what you're supposed to be doing. Okay, also, you can't talk about your experience with a product you haven't tried. Let's see, if you're paid to talk a product about a product and thought it was terrible, you can't say it's terrific. You can't make up claims about a product that would require proof the advertiser doesn't have, such as scientific proof that a product can treat a health condition. So, yeah, lots of stuff you're supposed to, and I, I will say I see a lot of people where I'm like, where it's very clear they are not, they are not doing all the disclosures they're supposed to be doing. So if you are an influencer out there or you create content, um, definitely brush up on the FTC guidelines on sponsored content and business. Like even if it's like a friend, like if you're pushing your friend's business, you need to say, hey, you know, I bought these earrings from a company. It's a friend of mine or this is my brother-in-law's company. You're supposed to disclose any relationship you have with a business or product you're mentioning. All right, let's go to some comments again. All right, uh, Risk was on Humane by sending the product for review. They should have known the problems before they sent it out for review. It's on them. And by the way, the, the, the people behind this Humane startup, it's a bunch of like ex-Apple employees and they spent like, a quarter of a million, a quarter of a billion dollars. I think it was $250 million. So this is not like some scrappy, you know, bootlegged up, bootstrap operation. This is a, a venture capital funded Silicon Valley startup with a quarter of a billion dollars. So to say that Marquez Brownlee like destroyed the company, I'm like, I, yeah, no, that, that, that's just ridiculous. Yep, yeah. how about those companies get a spine or focus on their product being quality, right? Yes. Yep. Yeah, and that's like, it's free. It was free advertising for them because no, like most people had not heard about this AI. Like I had no idea. I was like, what the, what the freak is that? I have no, I definitely am not buying it. That's for sure. 
Definitely not. I don't even... Yeah, I'm like, yeah, I have no need for that anyways, but whatever. Anyways, if this... If you think this is a bit ranty, it is what it is. That is my... Yeah, that's my opinion on... Uh, yeah, so I, I just think in this... A lot of the same issue... Just a lot of the same issues from all of that hubbub... I thought resonated a lot over to the sewing community as well because I think we run into a lot of the same problems, you know. And we've also seen a lot of the, like, small indie pattern designers that freak out if anyone says anything remotely negative about, like, a pattern or whatever. And I'm like, you need to get over yourselves. Like, you're a business, you know. Like, that comes with the territory. If you're selling something to a... If you're selling things to people... You need to be ready to also get some criticism about it, especially, you know, that's something every business needs to be able to deal with. And if you can't, you probably shouldn't be in business, you know. That's sort of the way it goes. Hello, Jules T. Cheers all was so busy before. Hello, Jules T. Welcome. Welcome to the stream. We're getting ranty about influencer marketing, but yeah, I just... Yeah, I've definitely got some gripes with the way things are going. And yeah, I've had some companies, like, I could tell I'm probably on the shit list for uh, Joanne, uh, Brother, uh, Cricket. They definitely do not like me. Funny enough, though, I did get a second email this week from someone with the marketing department of Craftsy asking me if I want to do sponsored videos. And I was like, I think you're talking to the wrong, like... This person has clearly done zero research on who I am. So I got a second email because I got one like in January and then I got a follow-up email from the same person uh, from marketing at Craftsy and they're asking me if I want to do uh, sponsored videos about Craftsy. What do you guys think the answer is to that? What do you think the answer is to that? All right, guys. <clears throat> but yeah, if you have any... And by the way, you might not know this, but before, like back in the day, I spent... I spent about five months working as a producer for the Home Shopping Network. A lot of you probably don't know this. It's like... It was kind of all a blur. I really hated the job. Um, but there was so much legal stuff about selling things that I had no idea existed. Like, there's a lot of legal issues with selling stuff on TV. Um, so I worked, we had to work with the legal department a lot, especially on anything like um, fitness or health or medical related. Like, you know, like, like we had stuff like, uh, like the fitness equipment or like, you know, even things where it's like, um, like those like beauty products with like before and after pictures. There was a lot of legal legalese about that stuff. Pretty much anything where you're making claims. Um, I also sold, I remember working on a product that was about like portion control for like dieting or something. And again, there was just so much legal red tape about um, what you're allowed to say and not, like what you're allowed to say about anything remotely related to like health and wellness it's like kind of insane um I really hated that job I learned some interesting things there but it just it just wasn't for me um but yeah I mean it just, it's basically like a 24 hour infomercial you know all right uh craftsy eight years ago and craftsy today are not the same animal yeah and you know I had craftsy back in the day craftsy OG was great I wouldn't worry about Joanne's. Uh, they're in borrow times anyways. Like, we'll we'll see what happens. I don't really know. I don't know what's going to go on with, uh, with Joanne's. But I want to know what you think. What do you think is... What do you think are some of the issues with influencer marketing in re regards to the sewing community? Like, what do you really have a problem with? Or what would you like to see change? I think there's a lot of changes that can be made to make the space better. You know, like, again, I don't have a problem with people doing, like, I understand the need for sponsors or especially if you're a smaller influencer, you know, you need stuff to feature on your social media channels. 
so you need you know you need products i totally get that i just think the way i just think that the relationships with the the influencers and the companies i think i think there needs to be some overhaul because i just don't i just don't think it's producing a lot of really good quality content when it's like when the company has any involvement in the content you know whether it be from like approving the content or even like and that's the thing even if you're not explicitly telling influencers what to say or not to say they all know that if they are not overwhelmingly positive about everything then you're not going to send them free products anymore you know you're kind of on the shit list and a lot of influencers kind of inherently know they don't want to be on the shit list from the brand you know what i'm saying so that's yeah that's what I got to say about all that. There's a lot more I could say. Maybe we'll get into that in another show. I don't know. But all right, guys. I want to get on to, oh, yes, our weekly, our weekly segment here. We got, we got to do it. We got to do it. All right. So this week in K-Drama Land, I am, I'm very confused about the show. I'm currently watching and I honestly don't know what's going like I'm on episode 5 of 12 of the show and I I am left so lost about the storyline I like I'm not even sure how to talk about this show because I I really don't know what's going on okay so let me pull this up I am currently watching a show on Viki, which is a an Asian streaming site. And the show is called uh, Wedding Impossible. I don't know how it is a 9.0 review on Viki. I, I honestly don't know. I'm so confused. Because right now I would probably give the show like a 6. Like a Yeah, like on it and... I don't usually rate a K-drama that low. I am just really... This is just not what I signed up for. Okay. So, if you, again, if you're new here, whenever I watch a lot of K-dramas, I'm kind of obsessed. And we do a segment called K-Drama Corner where I go over the show I'm currently watching or just finished or whatever. So this is called Wedding Impossible. This was a 2024 show, so it just went off the air. So look, it says romantic comedy and drama. Okay, so I was expecting more a uh, comedy here. And I'm not really getting that. All right, so the plot of this show. So it says, in the fun, hijinks-filled romantic comedy Wedding Impossible, struggling actress Na Ajong agrees to a contract marriage with her lifelong friend Lee Doan. In exchange for payment, she helps keep her friend's biggest secret from his overbearing family. The only hitch, Doan's younger brother, Lee Jian, refuses to accept her as his brother's fiance and challenges her at every turn. With Jian determined to sabotage their marriage from the beginning, how long will it take uh, for the truth to be revealed? So this is adapted from a webtoon of the same name. Okay, so... It's got 12 episodes, guys. I... Like, I, I don't even know. I'm not even really sure what the show is about at this point. Or, like, and I was trying to figure out, like, how I was going to talk about it to you guys. And I honestly, like, don't, I'm really confused. Okay, so, the deal with this show, and again, the premise, so notice in the summary it says, fun hijinks filled romantic comedy. I'm not, I'm not, that's not what we're getting so far. So I'm on episode five. Maybe it gets better from here. I don't know. Okay, so the two people in this photo here. So this is Ah Zhang. She's the, the struggling actress. So this is a gal who's, um, she gets like parts as like extras in like dr TV series or like movies. She doesn't get like, you know, she plays like courtyard lady number one or something, or she plays like an extra. And the guy next to her is her um, fake fiancé's younger brother. So this is uh, Gian. 
so I believe the premise of this show is that, like, okay, so I, and that's the thing, the first episode really was so disjointed and didn't make a lot of, like, they didn't really tell, I, I feel like the storytelling in this show is really, like, crappy, because, like, they introduce all of these characters, but, like, they don't, pro like, they just kind of throw them in there. You don't really get any context, and you're like, why are these people doing this? What What is going on here? Okay, so this um, actress lady, uh, Ajong, she, okay, so she has a, a lot, like a best friend, a guy, a guy best friend that's Doan, and they've been friends for 15 years. I think she's like maybe 29. She's in her like late 20s maybe. They've been friends since like high school or something. And he just spent the last five years. So this show takes place in South Korea. Her friend just spent five years in New York City. And he's some type of artist. They have not explained why this guy went to New York City or like what he was doing there. Uh, he's he's like a painter or something. Um, and they're like best friends. They're supposedly best friends. And uh, he's gay. So her, so obviously they're not romantically involved because uh, he is not interested in women, right? So he comes back to Korea. We also don't really get an explanation for why he decided to come back either. So I'm very confused about that. And then he comes back. So you find out that her, the gay guy's family is one of those like conglomerate, you know, high power business families. And this guy in the picture here, like the guy in the right, that's his brother. So this is his younger brother. He's straight. I, so again, you got the younger straight brother and then you got the older gay brother who, and the, the older brother is friends with her, right? So he comes back from New York City and also, they have, like, two other siblings. So they have two half-siblings. They've got a half-brother and a half-sister who are older. but they And they have the same mother, but they have different fathers. And I'm still really confused on why. Like, I honestly... Like, I I don't know. I honestly don't know. the Like, they, they, they'll do flashbacks on, like... But I, I, I'm so confused about, like how the mom like got with different guys and also the mother is dead i don't know what's going on with that so the mother is that their mother was actually the heir to this like conglomerate family or whatever so the grandpa is in the show so the grandpa is like the chairman of this multinational like corporation kind of thing i think they own department i think they own like shopping malls or something i'm i'm so confused i think they own shopping malls and they're in some other businesses like that Okay, so the older gay brother comes back from New York City and the grandfather tells him that he, they, he, instead, so the older siblings, the older half siblings, the brother and sister, they think they're going to be, they're going to get like the, they're going to be the heirs to like be in charge of the company. And instead the grandfather picks the older brother that's gay. Um, I don't know why he picked this guy, because he, all right, so Dohan has no involvement in the family business. He's an artist, and he has been in New York for the last five years doing God knows what. I have no idea what. So he comes back to Korea, and then it's announced that he's going to be the successor to this uh, huge business. But they have not explained even remotely why. He has no business experience, and he's an artist. Again, nothing wrong with being an artist, but he has not worked in the family business. Now, the guy in the photo here, the younger brother, he actually does want to be in charge of the business. He works at the business. I don't even know what his job is at this corporation. Like, they don't really say what it is. But he is, uh, he's, he's involved in the business. And he wants, for some reason though, he wants the older brother who's the artist he wants him to be the successor. I don't know why he doesn't want to be the successor, but he wants the brother who has no business experience to be in charge of this company. I'm like, I, I have no idea what the freak is going on. So he wants to be, he wants, so 
like this is where things go off the rails for me. So somewhere in like the mix of things, the older brother who's the artist decide so somewhere he decides he needs to marry his friend, the girl. I, I am honestly not sure why. Like they so he proposes they do a contract marriage. So he offers her like a few million dollars to be married to him for like three years, but it's obviously gonna be fake. Um also, like, so she knows he's gay. His family does not know he's gay. Which, so, but the other thing about her is that while she knows he's gay, she has no idea that his family is, like, wealthy. She doesn't know about the business. So, like, for them being such close friends for 15 years, she knows his, like, biggest secret but she doesn't know anything else about... She seemingly doesn't know anything else about him. She doesn't know he has a bro any siblings. She doesn't know that he's, like, the heir to this conglomerate family. She literally has never met any of the family members. But supposedly there's, like, best friends. So that's where I'm, like, very confused. The other thing I'm confused about with this show is that... I don't know why he needs to get married. Like, they don't really... Like, the storyline has not given us, as viewers, a legitimate reason for the premise of the whole show. So, at first, when the grandfather announces he's going to be, like, the successor to the business, he wants this guy who's gay to marry another businesswoman who would be, like, advantageous to their business, so... He wants her, he wants the grandson to marry this, like, female CEO. So I think, at first, to get out of that, he wants to pretend to be married to the frat, to his female friend. Um, and then the brother, yeah, this is, if you're like, what the hell is going on? I'm thinking this, like, this show, this storyline is so damn confusing. So the younger brother, the guy in the photo here, he is trying to break up the marriage, the prospective marriage between his brother and the female friend because he wants the older brother to marry the female businesswoman. You know, I don't know why. But then the grandfather, so they, they announce that they're going to be engaged, the, the gay older brother and then the female friend. They announce to the family that they're going to get married and the grandfather approves. So the grandfather does not think marrying this gal is a problem. So it kind of takes away. So, okay. So it takes away the, the premise because so there's a whole storyline that the younger brother is going to try to steal away the female lead character so that she doesn't marry his brother and that the brother marries the female CEO. But then when the grandfather approves of the marriage, that really takes away the premise of the younger brother stealing away the female char lead character because it's not a problem to the grandfather. But then the older brother decides that he's going to flee. He's going to check out altogether and flee to New York. And that, to me, takes away the whole, like need for him to get married period like if he's not going to be involved in the business and he's going back to new york i don't even know why I, we don't even know what he was doing in new york then that takes away the whole like that really takes away the whole premise of the entire show because yeah i'm uh, this is one of those shows where i've been re-watching scenes and i still don't know what's going on i'm like what just happened i have no idea if you're confused about this that's how it feels watching this show. Like, I am like, like, there's no purpose for anything. Because if this guy, if this artist guy is not going to be running this multinational business corporation or whatever, then he doesn't need to get married, period, really. And if the great, even if he does and he stays in Korea and he ends up marrying his friend, which he doesn't really need to do, the grandfather approves, so there's no need for the storyline about the younger brother trying to seduce her away from the older brother. And also, the younger brother doesn't know that his older brother is gay. So, 
the whole seduction thing is kind of pointless anyways, because it's not like his brother and the female lead have a real relationship anyways. Like, they're clearly not interested in each other. So I'm just like, I, I, I honestly don't know what's going on with this whole show. So I'm on episode 5 of 12. It's, it's hard to watch. Like, this is not one of those shows where it's like an easy... I just find myself wondering, like, I'm just sitting there the whole time, like, like, I, I, don't, I really don't know. The other thing about this show that I'm kind of disappointed in is if you just saw this thumbnail and the premise, you'd be like, okay, this is going to be a wacky show where there's going to be, like, a lot of scenes where the female lead and the, the gay guy have to pretend to be a couple and it's going to be funny and they're going to be, like, doing wedding planning and, like, all kinds of stuff like that. And it's not that at all. Like, there's no wedding planning. Like, there's no, like, it's not like they have to, like, pretend to be a couple at family, like, they've had to pretend to be a couple at, like, two family functions and it was very boring. So it's not like they have to pretend that they're, like, romantically involved. And I thought that would be, like, part of the hijinks. So, I don't know. This show is not... This show is just not what I signed up for. And I'm just, like... I don't know what's going on. So, I'll give you guys an update next week. But so far, I'm about halfway through. And, uh... It's, it's not making a lot of sense. Like, I... I just have no idea what's going on. So, if you have a Vicky subscription, I don't know if I would recommend this. So far, I would give the show, like, a like a six, maybe. There have been some funny scenes, uh, but they just have so much that they have not... Like, the writing is just very... La There's a lot of holes in the story. I just don't find this is, like... I just don't find this to be very um, easy to understand for me. So, maybe I'm just dumb. <laughs> I don't know, but... I'm just having a real hard time. I'm having a hard time following what's going on with this whole story. So, I don't know. But this is called Wedding Impossible. There's no... We That's the thing. There's no funny wedding stuff in it. Like, there's... No I don't know. Maybe it's... Maybe it's me. But, I don't know. I'm just... Yeah, I'm confused. I'm very confused, guys. Alright, we're gonna turn the music back on. And we'll read some comments. If you guys have any questions at all or any comments about influencer marketing and the sewing world let me know we'll hang out for a bit we'll chill all right everyone's talking about taylor swift in the comments oh yeah wait did taylor swift post a video of her sewing all right let me see if i can find it is that for real let's see here Okay, I don't... I don't see... Apparently she's been cooking. She's been doing some cooking. Yeah, I don't know. Okay. Okay, oh. There's... Okay, Travis Kelsey's designer reveals he was still sewing Chiefs stars Christmas gifts the night before he... Okay. I know um, one of the NFL wives sewed some jackets for Taylor Swift. Uh, yeah, I don't know. Yeah, if anyone has any leads on Taylor Swift sewing, let me know. Clearly, Vicky has been paying influencers for reviews. Let's look at some reviews because I'm just wondering how people are giving this a 9... Okay, I. What are p these people doing? Like, I don't know. Because I. So here's the reviews on the site. Scene stealers, cameos, and 75 inches of pro grade seduction? Yeah, I'm not getting that at all. Yeah, I don't know. Okay. That's a long review there. Yeah, I, and it's not even, like, one of those shows that you're, like, I don't find it's tugging at my heartstrings. It's not even really that funny. Like, it's just, like, a weird show so far. You know? I don't, hey, if you want an honest review, this is definitely my honest review so far about halfway in. I'm about to lose my mind over these characters. I have never seen a drama that includes literally every K-drama cliche, 
but still be so entertaining and captivating. Now, they have definitely had some funny... They've had some funny scenes. But I just find that the whole show overall is so confusing to me as a viewer. It's just hard for me... Like, it's hard for me to watch. It's hard for me to watch. Alright, Jen. YouTube doesn't have K-dramas. Wish they did. Yeah, they should. YouTube should license... They should have some free K-dramas. Yes, Tara, they are subtitled. And there are some K-dramas on, um, there's some on Netflix, there's some on Amazon Prime, there's some on even Apple TV and Hulu, I think, has some. So all of the streaming services seem to have at least a few K-dramas if you want to check them out. They're really good. Yeah, and they all have English subtitles. Watch with English subtitles. And don't do, like, I've noticed Netflix has, like, English dubbing. It's horrible. Watch in Korean just with English subtitles. The English dubbing just makes it look very hokey. But yeah, they definitely have some, uh, they definitely have, uh, subtitles. Is there a serial killer? Um, not yet, but we still got time. You know, I, I wouldn't be surprised if they threw in a serial killer just for the, just for the heck of it. Is there a ghost? Not yet. I'm surprised about that too. I'm surprised. Okay. I just Googled it. There's a ton of Etsy sewing patterns for Taylor Swift outfits. Hey. Well, hey, if that gets the Swifties into sewing, cool. Yeah, I was saying if Taylor Swift started sewing, maybe that would save Joanne. You know what? I wouldn't be... I mean, if Taylor Swift can save the NFL, <laughs> maybe Taylor Swift can save Joanne Fabrics. Okay. Uh, Jen, love when you interview a sewing community. Thank you, Lisa. Thank you very much. Man, yeah, this K-drama, I'm just, like, watching it. I'm like, what? I don't even know what's going on. Like, and I've had to rewatch scenes because I'm, I didn't really get what was happening. Like, some of the flashback scenes, I'm like, I don't know what. I don't know what's going on. But these characters, like, there's no, in my opinion, there's really no reason they have the writers have not created an actual need for the core premise of the story which is this like fake contract marriage you know i the okay the one thing i do like about this show they have a golden retriever named terry which is hilarious so i like the dog there's a dog and the one guy like keeps talking to the dog and it's literally this, like, real fluffy golden retriever, and his name is Terry. Like, T-E-R-R-Y. Uh, so that's pretty fun. Here, let me see if I can bring up Terry here. Because Terry is probably... I will say this. At this point, Terry is probably the main reason I'm still watching this show. Is for, uh... Is for scenes with Terry. Let's see here. Alright, I gotta turn the volume off here. Let's see here. Alright, let me see if I can find the scene with Terry. Because that scene was pretty... Those scenes are pretty funny. Let's see if I can find it. I like Terry. The, so Terry the dog is my uh, favorite character so far. Let's see here. Where is Terry? And Terry gets quite a few scenes, too. Okay. Okay. All right, I think I found it. Let me, I'll play this without the sound. Let's see here. Okay, guys. All right, so this is, this is Terry. This is Terry here. Okay. See, there's Terry. Isn't Terry adorable? So Terry's cool. I like Terry. I might be watching the show solely for this character at this point. He's just sitting there talking to his dog. I mean, you know, totally normal. I mean, how... And also, I keep wondering, how do they get Terry so fluffy? Like, honestly, if you have a golden retriever, how do they get Terry... How do they get him to look so floofy? He looks so cool. What a cool dog. So I'm a Terry fan. I think I'm a. I think Terry is. Uh, Terry is my favorite character of this uh, show so far. Anyway, so that is a K drama corner. Last call though, if you have any questions or comments on the live stream, 
I appreciate everyone watching tonight and on your way out, I would really greatly appreciate if you could hit the like button, subscribe to Sewing Report Live, if you would like to join in our Sunday night live streams every week at 6 p.m. Eastern time. Yes, Terry is so cute when all else fails. Throwing a dog. Yeah, at least I got the dog, you know. I don't know what else is going on otherwise, but Terry's Terry's cool. I like and I like that they gave I like that name. I think it's a cool name. But I, I really we've had a lot of fun. We'll tune in next week where I will continue to be cute confused. Uh, by this show, Wedding Impossible. And again, uh, one last shout out for today's live stream sponsor, the Sewing Report Etsy shop. So if you would like to support independent media like Sewing Report and Sewing Report Live, you like the honest reviews, you like the candidness, you like my rants. Every time you shop at the Sewing Report Etsy shop, it does help support uh, the work I'm doing here. Again, that means I don't have to worry about sponsors and all the other nonsense, and I can keep uh, doing what I'm doing without any restrictions. I sell fabric, I sell sewing supplies, and I just placed another inventory order so we will be getting in some of the some new stock because I sold out of, of a few things in the past uh, couple weeks. But again, I thank all of you for being here tonight. I hope everyone has a great week ahead and happy sewing, hanging out. And I hope you have a very, very, very awesome week. I'll see you guys again, same time, same place here at Sewing Report Live.